Hey traders, welcome to another global macro update. Quick update on the COVID spread. We have the total confirmed over 3 million now. US uh, coming up to 1 million here in terms of the total confirmed cases by country. Um, in total deaths, you see that there is over 200,000, so obviously not great, but countries are talking about easing lockdown and letting some non-essential businesses start back up. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail in this video. First thing I wanted to discuss in terms of the economics is the things that are gonna be coming up. We just had our consumer confidence statistic come in, which we'll talk about in the next post. But uh, for tomorrow, we got a lot of stuff. We got the GDP, which is absolutely huge. The forecast is negative 4% contraction in the GDP. We'll see how that comes out. Uh, I am living on the West Coast, so it's going to be coming out pretty early at 5.30. And then we got pending home sales, crude oil inventories. Uh, we got FOMC statements, interest rates. That'll be interesting. Uh, the forecast is not going to be changed. And then initial jobless claims, which hasn't really impacted the market really that significantly compared to the amount of uh, actual initial jobless claims that are coming in. Obviously, if you have been watching our videos, you've seen the chart, it really broke the chart. We haven't seen anything like this in terms of the numbers. And then we got to the PMI numbers to end it off for this week. Next week, don't we don't have a whole lot. We just have non-farm payroll, I believe. If this does load, Maybe not, we'll just skip it, that's all good. I believe next week is just non-farm NFP. And then this is going to be looking at the consumer confidence that came in. It was lower than what was forecasted. Forecasted was with 87.9, came in at 86.9. And we can see it's not that crazy low in terms of, in my opinion, um, you know, we're in a complete lockdown where basically every single non-essential service is closed yet the consumer confidence is sitting at 86.9. We can see that was around 2008, 2009 in the great financial crisis. And then 2000s in the dot-com bust, we had around lows of 61. I guess that was when we had 9-11 and the lows of dot-com was around 85. So we're around the same area as the low of the dot-com. And we've definitely seen lower with 08 as well as with 9-11 uh, there. All right, going on to what is going to be the potentially big mover for the equities market is going to be the GDP quarter over quarter. We can see that uh, we haven't really had a negative uh, quarter in a very long time. The last one was in 2015, and we haven't really seen some major negative growth uh, all the way until basically 20, 2009, sorry, 2008, when we had that uh, great financial crisis there where it contracted over 6.3, 6.2, which is pretty bad. So uh, right now the forecast is set up to be negative four. So we'll see how that goes. That would be kind of within this range at the start of 2000 and, or sorry, the start of 2009 right there. That's when we had that negative four and then it collapsed down to in the low sixes, negative 6.3, 6.2, somewhere like there. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see what the number is tomorrow morning. And uh, we will provide a global macro update going over the charts because obviously if it is a big number, in terms of how negative it is, uh, it will impact the markets, but if it's not as bad, obviously it would be a little bit more bullish. Next thing we're gonna be talking about is Germany's coronavirus infection rates edges higher after lockdown measures eases. So there are a lot of countries who are talking about potentially easing the lockdowns, letting some non-essential businesses open, but this does create a risk for a second and third wave and we already have seen uh, countries that have taken really extreme measures when they do try to ease back up and allow the economy to start back up again there are second and third waves it's not like a one and done situation and um yeah it, it's a fine balance between the economy and the health of the citizens for sure. So Germany's coronavirus infections rate has edged up, prompting concerns. Germany's already started to relax lockdown measures. So we'll see if they have to go back into major lockdown if this one single time did enough and then they're able to kind of 
have that fine balance between being able to open up the economy as well as being able to maintain safety for individuals. All right, quick look at some global numbers here. Spain's daily coronavirus death toll uh, rises slightly. Indonesia reports 214 new coronavirus infections, 22 more deaths. We've got nearly 200 new cases and 10 additional deaths in the Philippines. Russia reports almost 6,200 new cases. Total surpasses China. That's surprising when I read that. Actually, you can't really trust Chinese numbers. That's the, that's the issue with that. Um, Singapore preliminary confirms almost 800 new cases. And Thailand reports nine new cases and one death. So not so bad. Germany reports over 1,000 new cases and 110 deaths. I think that's about it. China reports three new cases, no additional deaths. Yeah, you, you got to be a little bit careful what comes out of China's um, in terms of the numbers. Australia reports 10 new cases. New Zealand sets to ease restrictions. This is what I'm talking about is countries around the world are now going into a point where they might ease restrictions. They might have uh, basically try to have that equilibrium where they're able to start the economy, start to get individuals back to work, start businesses back up, but then also maintain social distancing, maintain the, um, try to maintain um, some level of social distancing we can see right here and the ability to try to curb this uh, spread. So that's a bit of like the more global news. We're talking about obviously uh, a huge topic at hand is COVID. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is just a discussion about inflation. I know a lot of people are talking about it. I, I see a lot of people talking about how, you know, obviously with the monetary base increasing so substantially, like we've seen at the start of 2008, when the Fed has stated they're going to do unlimited QE. Obviously, it is concern for inflation. But in my personal view, I do not think we are in risk of inflation just yet. In order to have inflation, you need to have the velocity of the currency increase. You need to have people spending it, transacting it, using it within the economy. Right now, yes, we do have one ingredient of uh, like hyperinflation, seeing prices of assets and CPI go up. You have one portion of it, which is the increased money supply, which you can see right here within the monetary base uh, of M2, I believe, and then we can see we're, we're actually in deflation. This is the consumer price index or CPI. This is going to be the average price change of a basket of goods and services. And we can see we've been basically in inflation for since the 1940s, 1947. Uh, we did have a little slump in 2008, where it's a little bit of deflation. And then since then, it's really just been a straight move up. But you know, it will come a time where uh, we will be seeing velocity pick up. But right now, with the lockdown, with people saving, with not a lot of people uh, really, you know, being in a position to be frivolous, a lot of people lost their jobs. I think saving is going to be a mindset for a lot of individuals, especially if you lost your job and you're down on your luck. You're not wanting to go out and you know go shopping and, and spend a lot of money. You're going to want to save. You're going to want to conserve your capital because you don't know when the next rainy day is coming. And we can see the velocity of M2 money stock is going down significantly since uh, basically the early 2000s. This is 2001. Huge drop in velocity. Got a little bit of a pickup when we saw the boom of uh, the housing uh, bubble. And then once we saw 2007, 2008, there was a huge decrease in velocity. And since then, we haven't really seen it pick up. And this is on a quarterly, quarterly basis. So when Q1 does come in, we'll see how much slower, slower it is. And I think we'll really start to see the economic stats show the negative impacts in Q2 of 2020. So we'll have to wait a little while for that to come in. But I think that is when we'll have that second more economic um, understanding of how bad it really is. Last thing we're going to do to top it off is just go back in time and look at Japan's lost decade and what what this period of Japanese history teaches us about financial crises. In my opinion, uh, it's not exactly the same, but there are some similarities that the U.S. currently has with Japan in the 80s, and then they had their lost decade 
in basically at the end of the 80s, at the start of the 90s, until the 2000s. Um, really, for an entire decade, they couldn't get out of deflation. The prices of assets were going down. The stock market was going down. Real estate was going down, and it never really picked back up. So let's read into it. Japan's economy was the envy of the world before scrambling to one of the longest running economic crises in financial history that would come to be known as the lost decade. In the 1970s, Japan produced the world's second largest gross national product after the United States and by the late 1980s ranked first in GNP per capita worldwide. So they were booming, but all of that ended in the early 1990s when its economy stalled. All right, what caused Japan's lost decade? Most economic crises immediately follow an economic boom or valuations disconnected from reality. Does that sound like something? We'll get into something that is able to measure potentially a valuation of equities versus the GDP. For example, the dot-com bust and the Great Recession in the United States immediately followed several record US stock market valuations. Record low so this is what happened in Japan. Record low interest rates fueled stock market and real estate speculation that sent valuations soaring through the 1980s. That sounds very, very similar to what the United States saw post-2009 when they dropped interest rates and artificially kept them there for, I believe, seven years um, until 2015, 2014, something like that. They sl started slowly raising the rates, but... They, they kept them there for very long and look at uh, Japan, negative interest rates now. Look at Europe. There are countries like Switzerland, Sweden, Germany. I believe there are a few, I don't exactly know how many all of them are, but there are negative interest rate monetary policies um, that are actually being implemented in many uh, countries around the world. So yeah, that, that's record low interest rates if you, if you ever ask me. Um, let's look down a little bit deeper into this. Economist Paul Krugman blames the lost decade on consumers and companies that save too much and cause the economy to slow. So definitely some people think that, uh, you know, in a Keynesian economist viewpoint, savers should be punished and everyone should be a good consumer and consume as much as they can um, because that drives the economy. And yes, it does, but, you know, just basically saying um, savers are to blame, I don't think is the right way to go about doing things. Other economists point blame at the country's aging population. That totally makes sense because a demographic will play a huge role within society, within economics. When there's a huge uh, demographic cycle and, and a large population going through an economy, it's at first very inflationary because there's a large group of individuals buying their first car, couch, bed, house, all the all the all the large ticket items in life clothing but then when they leave they are mostly sellers when they are retired if you're living off of interest you are either you know trying to basically maintain your wealth slowly slowly grow it um and and as time goes on if you go on trips if you go vacations if you buy any other items that are large um you're going to sell assets to fund those expenses and, and, and you're more of a seller than a than a buyer Following the crisis, many Japanese citizens responded to uh, responded by saving more and spending less, which had negative impact on aggregate demand. This contributed to deflationary pressures that encouraged consumers to further hoard money, which resulted in a deflationary spiral. So this is going to be the velocity of money. This is how fast uh, people are transacting currency, and this is the consumer confidence. So this is why stats like consumer confidence is important because you're able to understand are they wanting to spend money are they going to go out and you know go on a date go out and buy some food go to the bar go out and watch the game and you know like just be a more of a consumer and assume that your future is more prosperous compared to a saver who is saving for a rainy day not spending money because they assume that there's going to be negative turbulent times ahead now to finish it off, before we get into the charts, is the market cap to GDP, or Wilshire 5000 GDP ratio, created by Warren Buffett, or thanks to Warren Buffett. 
Market GDP, market cap to GDP is a long-term valuation indicator for stocks. It has become popular in recent years thanks to Warren Buffett. Back in 2001, he remarked in a Fortune magazine interview that it is probably the best single measure of where valuations stand at any given moment. So it's widely accepted as a definitive benchmark for the United States equity market and is intended to measure the total market capitalization of most publicly traded companies headquartered in the United States. And this dates all the way back to 1971. Now, uh, we, we do have a date back further, but we're just going to watch, obviously, the more recent price action here within the last couple or the last uh, handfuls of decades here. So first things first, the mean average is sitting at around 0.8. The high of 2000 at the dot-com bubble was around 1.45, 1.40, and then the low was around 0.7 right around there in February of 20, uh, 2003, which was around a 52% drop. In 2007, the housing bubble in the United States, the market cap to GDP was around one. We can see it's just sitting maybe a little bit around one, 1 1.06, and then dropped down to basically 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.53. So let's say it's just you know around 50% drop in market cap to GDP. So both times in 2000 and 2007, we had a 52% drop roughly and then around a 50% drop. What we're seeing right now, let's zoom into the more recent price action. From the high of around 1.57, we didn't hit 1.6, we were just shy of 1.6. And the low was, let's just zoom in a little bit closer here was around 1.1 ish. So, you know, 36 ish percent drop. I believe somewhere around there, um, which is a lot less than 2000 and 2008. So in my personal view, this is going to be more of a bias on how negative do you think that COVID and oil capitulation is to the United States economy? Because at the end of the day, stocks have to couple back with reality in some sense. Yes, there can be distortions where they're decoupled, where stock valuations aren't representative of economic uh, health. Uh, there's definitely times of that, but you know there can't be a massive capitulation in the economy with a huge deflationary downturn for a multi-year time frame, and then the stock valuation just continue going up. I just don't think that's possible. It hasn't happened, right? Like every economic bust ends with the stock market going down in value as well. Like imagine 2008 and how negative that was, but then the stock market still continuing to go up. But then now you have an entire economy, but not just the United States, but the entire globe that is in complete lockdown. Yes, there are some easings of that, but at the end of the day, I'm sure everyone is well aware of the devastating impacts that this has. And then layer on oil prices, layer on the fact that basically all oil companies uh, in the United States cannot produce oil uh, profitably, basically, w with how volatile it is, with negative oil prices, there's no more supply space available. And until this lockdown stops and there is a reopening of the economy, uh, airplanes are going, trains are going, cars are going, there is basically, you know, cars and, and things needing oil, there's not going to be that demand there. There just isn't. So until the fundamentals are changing, I don't think that uh, the capitulation will stop. So that's basically looking at it 36%. And if we're seeing like we saw in 2000 in the dot-com bubble and 2007 in the housing bubble, if we're looking at around a 50%, let's say, we're looking at just shy of 0.8, right? So we're around here. And then if we go to around 50%, like we had in the two previous market crashes, it would be around 0.8, so just under the mean average. So that means that if we're looking at previous historic time frames, we can't extrapolate exactly from the past and say, this is what's going to happen in the future. That's not how it works. But if we're able to understand what happened in the past and then compare contrast, that is speculation, right? You won't, no one has a crystal ball and says, this is exactly what's going to happen. Some people are bullish, some people are bearish. But in my, in my personal view, this is 
more detrimental to the economy than what we had in 08, 2000, and some people are even comparing it to the 1929, 1930s Great Depression. So it's not just me who has that viewpoint. There are you know, leading economists that do think that this is absolutely devastating. And we've seen massive pushes to the downside and then a pullback that is above 50% before it's happened. And we did move to the downside. So my bias is still exactly the same. I'm still bearish because we've only really seen max a 36% drop from the highs in market cap to GDP. Whereas in other economic downturns where we saw stock market crashes in recessions like we are in right now, we've seen 50% or more of a decimation in the market cap to GDP. So that's my personal viewpoint. Um, you know, obviously everyone has a different point of view, but that is uh, kind of another reason why I'm still having my bias. And now let's look into the charts. I'm gonna quickly have some water and then we'll dive into the price action here. All right. I'm gonna get my snip and let's just talk about what we can see on the six hour chart here. So we did get an open that was quite a bit higher. These are uh, contracts, so they're trading on a different time frame compared to the equities market. They trade for longer hours like futures. But anyways, we see that we did get a pop up. We opened higher. We did slam back down, back below the resistance level, which is good to see. We did get a lot of sell pressure coming in there as well with a wick uh, validating that there are sellers in the market. But it does look like we are holding that resistance just ever so uh, closely that if it does break, I think we could get a little another move to the upside. And then the last final level of resistance that we have would be the 618 level. This dotted green, or sorry, this lot dotted red line at 2951 represents just above the 61.8 fib level from the high to the low. And if it goes above there, I'm going to have to ease off, change my bias. Uh, I will get closed out of my short position. I do have a short on uh, on this current trade and this is basically my stop loss. If it goes above there and holds, I'm just gonna say, you know what, I'm wrong, I'm gonna wait. I still do have a bearish bias within uh, the S&P because at the end of the day, it's not it's not bullish. There's, there's nothing bullish about the economy. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, there's no fucking way that there can be a bull run and, and see highs and break highs when we have 26 million people l losing their jobs in six weeks and unemployment when we get the numbers potentially hitting uh, plus 20%. That is recession, depression numbers. And there can't be that distant disconnection between the equities market and the, and the real economy. So I'm going to have my bearish bias, even if we hit the 2951 stop loss that I currently have. But if we're holding this level of, of uh, resistance at around 2880, uh, we can probably safely assume that uh, we'll get some consolidation until we actually see a drop. We have a uh, first support, second support, third support. We might get a third and fourth, but at the end of the day, we are looking at this as a potential ascending triangle, which is, yes, a little bit more bullish, but we can see this uh, sort of pattern appear before. We'll look at the Japan's asset bubble in the 1980s and how that popped, what happened to the price action, and uh, how it kind of looks like what we can see right now. So first off, I just want to kind of give you a good understanding of what happened in my view. We had a wedge like there, lines aren't perfect, but we had a nice wedge, massive move to the downside. The wedge is our pullback and this is the 50 around here to the 61.8% FIB level. And then what we're seeing right, oh, excuse me, what we're seeing right now is initial push to the downside, major rejection from the bulls, and then we're getting a second attempt for a leg up in order to retest those highs. You can also call this a double top as long as it holds. What happened in Japan in uh, 1980s? This is the exact chart. We can see 1990 right here. This is the start of the 90s for Japan. We got a massive move to the downside. It dropped 
20, let's say 29% from the high. It retraced, it pulled back to the 50% level, had a nice ascending channel, very tight consolidation. We initially got a push down. I think a lot of people were expecting this to continue further down. We got a bounce holding a previous level of resistance and support, creating a sideways consolidation. Initially, you would draw this trend line, I'm sure, like here or like here, but you would draw some trend line connecting the lower highs because this is the high to break. We got the price to go all the way back up to the high, creating a double top. Once this double top held, we can see the price held multiple times at this zone. Once you started to see the momentum and especially once you started and saw that breakdown to confirm the double top with the neckline broken, that is a point where in my opinion, we should really be thinking of potentially adding a significant amount on at that point because that's definitely a major rejection. Um, and that would be the highest confirmation location to potentially add to a short in my personal view. But uh, bringing it back to what we can see right now, let's just bring back our fibs. And then let me, let's just take away this and this for now. Actually, I think that's a pretty clear, clearly shown uh, chart we can see. Notice the similarities from Japan and the current price action. We did have a wedge or an ascending channel very similar in terms of the structure towards the upside. We broke, we tried to push to the downside. This wasn't as significant, but it still pushed to the downside, broke the support, and then we held this, the, the demand zone multiple times and we start seeing a series of higher lows push the price, retesting the high that we saw right here. So the way I'm looking at it is now going to be a double top. If it breaks this zone, Going to be very worrying for the bears definitely would be a lot more uh worrying for definitely people shorting for longs uh, i don't think it's out of the woods yet i'm still still going to be looking short even within uh this range right here it doesn't really matter because we've seen it hit the 618 before and then move down so that's why i'm going above the zone but at the end of the day uh i'm still bearish i i, I really am um, we can see a little channel right here. I think if we do start to see a hold of this resistance zone and then a push down further, I think uh, that would be a little bit more favorable for the bears. But, you know, I'm not an absolute perma, bull, uh, perma bear. If, if it does just continue to trend up, I'm not going to continually try to add shorts. If I don't know what's happening, I just won't enter a trade. It's just simple as that. Right now, I feel like I still have edge. I totally still have a good understanding of what's occurring in the markets in my personal view. Um, there's still a lot of fundamentals that are going to be coming into play for this week with the GDP numbers, with uh, initial job loss claims, not really going to be doing a whole lot in my personal view because they've been coming out uh, in waves. It's a weekly report and it really hasn't done much to... Um, the market, we can see this is the chart right here. We talk about it often. You know, since March, it's just been millions of millions and millions of people losing their jobs on a weekly basis. We see 3 million people, 6 million people, 6 million people, 5 million, 4 million. We're seeing millions of people lose their job on a weekly basis. And this isn't, it's not like people are losing less jobs here. They're still losing 6 million, 6 million brand new, 5 million brand new, 4 million brand new. That's a shit ton of people losing their jobs. So, you know, share buybacks are not really um, to its full potential, obviously, with COVID, with oil. Um, some companies are obviously able to, Netflix, Amazon, uh, companies that are somewhat benefiting from this they have the increased cash flow to buy back shares if it would if they would like to but um for a lot of companies they don't have the capital they don't have the revenues to be doing that at this point so you know that's a little bit more bearish as well so i do obviously have a bearish bias so i'm going to kind of funnel information into that bias because like in these market conditions, if you are not a short-term day trader, you gotta have you can't be bearish biased and then bullish biased on a flip of a switch every other day because you're just gonna get annihilated in terms of the amount of trades you're taking, in terms of the fake outs. 
yeah, it, it's very easy to get faked out if you don't have a bias. But you know, for the fundamentals, I'm super bearish, which then plays into the technicals. So that's basically my analysis. You hopefully got something from it. I thought this was pretty interesting, market cap to GDP. Uh, if you'd like a link, um, let me know in the Discord or in the comment section below on this YouTube, and I'll be happy to post that within the comment section below. Um, so that's gonna be the completion of the video. I will answer all questions within the YouTube because we are doing this live on YouTube as well. So thank you very much for watching everyone. And until next time, have a good one.